I like to think that I know what I'm doing when I make these videos, but sometimes it becomes very obvious that history is the one in charge here, and not me. See, I had intended to make a video about King Frederick II as a companion piece to my video on Sicily, where I'd use his status as both King of Sicily and Holy Roman Emperor to explore the changing cultural atmosphere of Sicily as it passed from the Norman kings to German ones. Oh wow, cool! What happens when a pan-Mediterranean society of Normans, Lombards, Greeks, and Arabs pivots north towards mainland Europe? What remains? What gets cut? What gets added? Analyzing cultural nuance, good golly gosh! But, as it happens, very little of that matters to us today, because as I did my research, this video revealed to me that it is actually an episode of Pope Fights. So, to take what will be a surprisingly far-reaching tour of high medieval shenanigans, let's do some history. At the end of the 1100s, kingship of Sicily in southern Italy passed by marriage from the Norman Hotville family to the Holy Roman German Emperor Henry VI of the Hohenstaufen dynasty. He considered Sicily little more than a shiny novelty, so he plundered it for all it was worth, shipped everything sparkly back to Germany, and brutally punished anyone who resisted. Luckily for the Sicilians, he died three short years later in 1197, and the crown passed to his infant son Frederick II, who was slightly too young to govern even by medieval standards, so the responsibility of babysitting the kingdom of Sicily went to their northern neighbor, the Pope. That didn't go so hot, since Pope Innocent III was busy with Pope stuff, so local German barons were left in charge. They were fully uninterested in cleaning up the wreck Henry left behind, and the kingdom was a mess of lawlessness and inter-ethnic violence. Yikes! Luckily for young Frederick, the royal court retains that multicultural atmosphere, so he grew up in the worldly, sophisticated mold of the Norman kings before him. He also enjoyed philosophy, had a mind for science, was insatiably curious about the world around him, and enjoyed falconry more than anything else on God's green earth. So much that he literally wrote the definitive treatise on bird science and hunting with birds of prey. Every chance he got, the man was out falconing in Sicily. The problem was, after Henry died, the part of his royal domains that he actually cared about Germany, was in some hot water on account of the multiple civil wars that sprung from the succession crisis caused by Henry's surprisingly early death. Now, this was not Frederick's responsibility, however, it would become his problem. The Holy Roman Empire had spent the past few decades dancing with the papacy around the question of who was actually in charge, and the plot twist is that it would be neither of them, because local lords and princes had gotten really crafty at playing the two off each other in exchange for more privileges and autonomy. Emperors and popes played this game with each other, too, as Frederick's rival Otto bribed his way onto the imperial throne with concessions to papal authority, but when Otto invaded Italy, the Pope got spooked and backed Frederick as the new emperor. Still kinda bad for the Pope, because Frederick sandwiched him from the north and now the south, but he made young Freddy Pinky promise to go on a crusade, so not the worst deal in the world. Given the last crusade had completely failed, and the one before that ended up sacking the very Christian city of Constantinople, Whoops. It would be hard to do worse. Much to the frustration of Pope Honorius in particular, and Germany in general, Frederick was distinctly unenthused about his new responsibilities, to go on crusade and even to be the emperor. So he instead spent all his time back home in Sicily, hanging out with the royal court, and repairing the kingdom that his father Henry had so delicately ruined. In a reversal of trends north of the Alps, Frederick actually restored some sense of royal authority and put the kingdom back in order. He carefully kneecapped the nobility and confiscated many of their castles, ended the Genoese trading monopoly, which had been slowly strangling the treasury, and slightly reorganized his subjects so they'd be less likely to murder each other, which, in the past three decades, they had very much been doing. Frederick granted protected status to Jews and scooted the increasingly rebellious Arab population of western Sicily over to Apulia, where many worked as blacksmiths and his personal bodyguard. So we can see the steady downward trend, as the diversity that characterized the Norman period was still there, but far more in pockets than it was before and his relationship with Islam was about to get a little more awkward because, as the Pope was keen to remind him, Frederick was still on the hook to go crusade. After marrying Queen Isabella of Jerusalem in 1225, King Frederick of technically Jerusalem now finally had a personal motivation to make the journey. And to get Pope Honorius to quit bothering him about it all the time, Frederick vowed to complete his crusade or face excommunication if he failed. Problem was, Frederick got sick right when he left for the Holy Land, so he sent his army on ahead but went home to Italy to rest up, and the Pope considered this a breach of contract and excommunicated him. Now, in addition to instant damnation, this meant Frederick was now forbidden to actually go on the crusade he was punished for not going on. Frederick still wanted to go to meet up with his army and claim the city he was technically king of. However, the Pope offered Frederick a convenient and straightforward way to escape his excommunication, surrender the Kingdom of Sicily to the Pope. 
weird that Frederick's only option to save his immortal soul had nothing to do with piety. But Frederick didn't care what the Pope said before, and he wasn't about to start now, so he rested up in Italy and then went on his merry way to the Holy Lands to get himself that city. Excommunication be damned. Literally. So off he goes to the Holy Land on the next boat out, for which the Pope excommunicated him again, but who cares, and he clowns on the entire concept of holy war by negotiating Jerusalem back from the Sultan. The Ayyubid Empire was dealing with enough internal problems that a ten-year truce and the promise to help him against his rebellious brothers was worth trading one city. The local Christians howled in disappointment, as they had failed to take Jerusalem for four decades and got outplayed by the guy who barely even wanted to be there. Contemporary Islamic sources were likewise very upset about it, but they took Jerusalem back in like 15 years, so they got over it. Which goes to show that even when crusades are astonishingly successful, they still do not actually accomplish anything. But nobody was angrier than Pope Gregory, who couldn't believe that a filthy excommunicate had conquered Jerusalem. So he cut out the middleman, and rather than theologically extort Frederick for his kingdom, he just called a crusade and marched on down to take it by force. However, the Pope was a worse crusade crusader than Frederick was, so his army shattered on impact and Gregory begrudgingly agreed to leave the man be. For now. The Pope took the breathing room to go reform the Vatican, or whatever, who cares, but Frederick had more problems, because in 1231, his son King Henry of Germany was berated by the local nobles and princes into essentially granting them complete legal autonomy from the Emperor. In addition to being a colossal blow to the Holy Roman Empire in the long run, this was an immediate problem for Frederick on account of losing all of his imperial authority. This act of open rebellion against his father resulted in Henry getting extremely grounded in 1235 for life. After that, the imperial territories in Germany settled down, but the ones in northern Italy did not. So, slight backstory, after Grandpappy Frederick I Barbarossa claimed direct authority over the imperial domains in Italy, the cities formed a Lombard League to collectively ask that he shove off. This was great for the popes, who also wanted the emperor to shove off. Germany was far away and didn't matter, but Italy was where they are, and if the emperor was also right there, that's a problem. And now that Frederick II was out on the prowl to reimpose his authority, the Italian cities renewed the League to drive him out, and the Pope contributed by once again excommunicating Frederick. Which, like, sure, permadamnation is a pretty steep penalty, but if it didn't work before, twice, why would it work now? More tactically concerning was that Gregory called another crusade against him and said that any crusader who vowed to fight in the Holy Land could fulfill their crusading obligation by fighting Frederick. At this point, Frederick was so thoroughly done with Gregory's antics that he marched down into the Papal States and camped his army right outside the walls of Rome, where he proceeded to kidnap all the bishops headed into the city. Pope Gregory, surrounded not just on his northern and southern borders, but now within line of sight from his house, died in 1241, quite possibly out of pure fear or to rob Frederick of the satisfaction of killing him. Granted, the man was at least in his 70s, so he probably just died, like, normally, but these two idiots had been at each other's throats for over a decade, so I will only accept the most dramatic ending possible. Anyway, with the mission basically accomplished, Frederick hustled back to Sicily to deal with a revolt on account of him having been the target of a crusade, and he almost needed to head back north to deal with the arrival of the Mongols. But lucky for him, for once, they left almost as soon as they arrived, so the Europeans breathed a sigh of relief and dutifully got back to fighting each other. Because for all the trouble Gregory caused, the new Pope, Innocent IV, was an even greater headache. In 1245, he declared the still-excommunicated Frederick deposed as Emperor and branded him a heretic and a predecessor to the Antichrist, while, of course, renewing the call for crusade. So off Frederick went, again, until his army got completely routed while attacking the city of Parma. After this stunning defeat, as well as the loss of the imperial treasure, which for some reason he brought to the siege, the jig was up and Frederick went home to Sicily. But given how much he preferred being in Sicily to anything else, not a bad consolation prize. In the span of half a decade, Jerusalem was gone, Northern Italy was gone, Germany was basically gone, so in his last few years he enjoyed the pleasures of royal life in Sicily. Frederick was a man of many interests, known in Europe as Stupor Mundi, the wonder of the world, but we should especially thank him for filling out the biggest gap in Sicilian culture, literature. The Normans and friends had an astounding talent for architecture, science, and law, but they weren't storytellers. Under Frederick, the Sicilian school of poetry invented the sonnet and pioneered literature in the local Italian vernacular a century ahead of 
Dante writing in his local Tuscan. By the time of Frederick's death in 1250, it's easy to argue that he lost. The Holy Roman Empire fell into a half-century interregnum and disintegrated in all but name, the Kingdom of Sicily fell back into diet anarchy and was conquered by the French House of Anjou just 16 years later, and those pesky popes got the last laugh after all. So on paper, sure, Popes won, heretical demon tyrant zero, okay, but the papacy didn't win so much as it just survived. Frederick was their most existentially terrifying foe in centuries, and as far as he cared, they were just a hassle who dragged them away from Sicily and got in the way of his poetry and falconing. There's plenty of scholarly debate as to whether he was a renaissance prince ahead of his time, but to have been the emperor and an unparalleled crusader, yet still want nothing more than to simply hang out in Italy. Italy? Damn if that isn't a mood. Thank you so much for watching. I feel like this is one of those rare videos that is a highly specific whirlwind of a time, yet also manages to be surprisingly representative of the high medieval period as a whole. And it's a Pope Fights video. Wins all round. Thank you to our Patreon community who made this video possible, and I will see you all in the next video.